You're listening to I for Detail, the weekly podcast for indie product makers. I'm your host, Ryan Glover, CEO and mentor at Clever Beagle. Thanks for listening in, folks. Uh, this show is going to be a little bit different. So uh, up until now, I've been doing these episodes with Alex Price, who's the co-founder of Remote One and Offset Earth. And uh, I spoke with Alex because he's been pretty tied up with the Offset Earth stuff. And we kind of decided that it'd be best if uh, I went ahead alone doing these just to make sure that they're consistent and we don't have uh, any major scheduling issues. So what's going to happen from here on out is I'm going to be primarily the one uh, kind of doing the yapping and talking about the topics. Uh, but on occasion, when it works with his schedule, uh, I'm going to invite Alex back in and, and he'll chime in as well. But for now, it's, it's just going to be me. So uh, just not to, to, to freak you out, no, no bad blood or anything like that, just a, a scheduling issue. Um, so uh, that's, that's what we're going to do moving forward. So uh, I should mention now, if you're interested in joining me yourself, uh, you want to be a guest or you, you know, want to kind of chime in in that co-host role, I can always use the help. So definitely uh, send me an email uh, or send something on Twitter. So send something to ryan.glover at cleverbeagle.com uh, if you want to you wanna do that over email or just send me a tweet um, at rglover on Twitter and I'd be, be happy to hear you out. So uh, for this week's episode, what we're going to do is also something different. So not only am I by myself this time, uh, but uh, this came up, came up with Alex, but I decided to actually go ahead and try it out, uh, which is doing video. So maybe you're watching this uh, on the Clever Beagle YouTube channel uh, as opposed to listening over audio only. Um, and yeah, this is, a, this is a new thing. So I'm not really going to, to over-invest here. Um, I've got my, my camera up there on a tripod, and I've just kind of got a simple setup. So we'll see as I go if I can figure out you know, a, a solid format for this. So it's, it's really uh, fun and enjoyable for you folks. But I, I thought it would be good uh, to go beyond audio only because I know uh, video podcasting and all that stuff is, is pretty popular these days. And it's nice to be able to, to put on a video while you're working or, or doing something like that. So uh, it may sound weird at times, especially during this first episode where I'm getting used to and getting comfortable with uh, having a video camera on me. But I, I think over time, it'll, it'll kind of gel out. So this week's episode is going to be all about why refactoring is essential to a great product. So the thing that kind of happens when you when you start writing software, so it, we're, we'll get to products, but I just want to talk about uh, writing code and writing software in general. And, and one of the things that happens, and this is inevitable, is you, you cross that line where you go from kind of like the early frustration, not really understanding stuff into the phase where you can actually get stuff to work. So this is, uh, you know, you have an idea for something and you roughly understand the, the code that you need to write to get it done. And with a little bit of fiddling and a few hours of work, you can actually get something kind of on screen and working. And I would argue that this is probably one of the most exciting things to, to have happen to you uh, when you first start writing code and getting serious about it is actually making stuff work because early on it's it's like I said it's frustrating it's not the most fun thing uh, but eventually you do cross that line where you can get stuff to work uh, and I would say if you're not doing this professionally or or maybe you are but it, it, it really depends kind of on the culture of the team but unfortunately a lot of people don't go beyond that stage meaning they, they figure out how to get stuff to work and they can make it work consistently, uh, but they don't take it to what I like to refer to as the nth degree, meaning you're not pushing that code as far as you absolutely could. Um, and so this is where you get into a situation where, and, and I know this comes up because I, I, I teach some folks who are uh, professional software developers during the day, and then I work with them as mentees at Clever Beagle to, to help them build their own product. And it's not uncommon to get stories like, yeah, you know, I spent the day chasing down bugs and doing all, all this work that wasn't really focused on improving the product or anything like that, like adding features. Um, and it's, it's common enough where it's one of those things where at least a few years ago I started to ask because I noticed the same problem in my own work. I would, I would build stuff and it, it, would, it would work, but it wouldn't work in every case. And so I was constantly having to kind of backpedal and, and especially because the stuff that I was building was customer facing, I was constantly having to apologize. And I was basically the lightning rod because it was 
it's me. It's always been me just kind of by myself. So I was in this situation where I've got code that, you know, I didn't really push as far as I could failing on people. And eventually I got into this cycle. And, and, and again, I, I heard this from people I'm teaching and just in general, just in, in kind of conversations I've had with other developers. I got into this situation where the same problems kept coming up. Yep, I'm wasting all this time chasing dumb bugs. Yep, uh, this thing keeps breaking on me and it keeps breaking in random ways and, and et cetera, et cetera. And that's right about the time that I came across a guy. And I've talked about him, I want to say on the podcast, but I've definitely talked about him uh, in blog posts and pretty much any content I've put out at least in the last two or three years here. Uh, and he goes by the name Uncle Bob. Um, but, uh, his, his name is Bob Martin, uh, and Bob or uncle Bob Martin, uh, he runs an excellent website. I I highly recommend it. It's cleancoders.com. So he does a lot of very, they're informative videos, but the reason I laugh is, uh, they're also very entertaining. He, he really does a lot of production with them and he's, he's a very silly, fun guy. So, um, it's, it's not just kind of an informational or educational thing. They're actually quite hilarious to watch and, and fun. So you, you get some entertainment and you also, you also learn stuff from them. Uh, but one of the things that I came across of Bob's, uh, and again, this is probably two, three years ago now, um, it was a quote, and I don't know if it was in something he wrote or somebody else wrote it, but it said something along the lines of, when you rush, you make messes. And it was one of those things that I heard it, and it kind of went deep in my subconscious, and then I, it didn't really register. And so over the course of the time, so from the point I heard that up until, uh, I don't know, relatively recently, honestly, like probably the last year, maybe six months, it didn't really sink in what he was talking about. And what he was talking about is this kind of notion of this behavior where uh, you're so eager to get something out the door that you just rush through building it. And you basically what you do is you focus only on what a lot of developers refer to as the happy path. So you build the thing, you get it to work and, you know, you, um, you you don't really go beyond that. (laughs) So you get it to work in the browser, maybe like you click the button and it does what you expect, but you don't really consider like, okay, so what's going to happen if that doesn't go perfectly or what's going to happen if. Uh, I push the button and the network's down, or if I push that button and that third party service I'm depending on, on the server side goes down, so any, any number of things. But basically the point being that a lot of code is written such that it's, it's only covering that happy path and then that's it. And then it's pushed into production. And this may sound like me wagging my finger, but again, I've only recently started to really understand what that means. Uh, meaning uh, what Bob was talking about. So he's talking about uh, when you rush, you make messes or rushing makes messes. And the idea is that when you write code in that kind of unnecessarily quick haphazard way where you're just like, you're just trying to get it to work and, and it's, you have this physical feeling of anxiety, like you're just trying to get it done and you make these obscene promises to people <laughs> and they're like, I, I don't know what it is. There, there's gotta be some uh, name for it. Uh, psychologically, but it's, it seems to plague developers quite a bit, which is, we all have this sense of hubris. We're like, no, 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 I can, I can get that done in, in two weeks. And then next thing you know, it's like two weeks is up and it's like, well, no, 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 just give me two more weeks. And then it's, and that's the other, that's the thing. Like that's the comeback it's, it's always two more weeks. Um, and for whatever reason, we get stuck in this cycle where it's like deep in our minds. I think we know that no, it's not going to take two weeks. It's going to take three weeks or four weeks or six weeks or however long it's going to take. But we have this weird optimism where we kind of get into this trap of, okay, we're going to, we're going to meet this ridiculous goal. And then because we can't actually meet it, we end up rushing to meet it. So we, we, we meet it in the, the, the most shallow sense. Like we, we get something out the door at that date that we said, but the quality of what we get out is subpar at best. Like it's, it works, but eh, it's got some, it's got some holes to it that we got to fix. Uh, but unfortunately like that never really happens. Like very few people are, are going to take the time to say, you know what? I got it to work, but let me, let me refactor it and let me work on it. And, and that's that, that word is important. So refactor. And, and that's what I want to kind of spend the rest of this podcast talking about is taking the time to not just get code to work, but 
And and this 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 is another quote that's that's super important. So uh, there's a programmer by the name of Kent Beck, uh, who who's been through the paces. Uh, he's he's a, he's an older gentleman, uh, but he's he has an insane amount of experience, and he's the creator of. Uh, uh, a software development methodology called extreme programming. So if you haven't heard of it, definitely look it up and check it out. It's just a way, and it's it's primarily tilted toward teams and companies, but it's a, it's a way of thinking about uh, managing the the software development process and the things that you need to do in order to develop uh, code that's really solid and also responds well to uh, the changes in customer requirements. I'm butchering that, but definitely check it out. Uh, but the important part is a quote that, that, uh, Kent made, I couldn't tell you where it came from. Uh, but it, and it's, it's, I think it's like nine words. It's make it work, make it right, make it fast. And I'm going to guess because I know he's written books. It came from something like that. Uh, but I, and I'm going to say this again. So make it work, make it right, make it fast. And that quote kind of plays into what I'm getting at here. So when we're talking about refactoring, refactoring at its at its its uh, topmost level is going from making it work to making it right. And so it's worth kind of discussing, like, well, well, what exactly is making it work versus making it right? And so making it work is is what we just talked about. So it's you can you can click the button and you know it it uploads the thing or it stores the thing in the database or it does roughly what you expect. But the code that you wrote to make it work may not be the prettiest. It could be disorganized. It could be, you know, like you've got bad names kind of peppered everywhere and your syntax is a mess and it's not really clear like how you get from A to B. It's all just kind of cobbled together and it's generally it's just a mess. So like Uncle Bob talked about, like you, you've rushed and you've made a mess. It's a visible thing. It's almost like you look at the code base and it's it's analogous to a dirty room. Like it just, something about it doesn't feel right. Something about it feels unclean. Um, and so that's the first part of this this quote by Kent Beck and this idea, which is, going from making it work to making it right. So making it right is basically saying, okay, I have this messy room and I acknowledge that, I accept that. And yeah, I can kind of move around the room and maybe if it's a bedroom, I can sleep in the room or I could work in the room if it's an office, but it's just uncomfortable. There's maybe there's like, there's a bowl of food that shouldn't be there in the corner and there's roaches climbing all over it and something smells. You don't know what smells, but something smells. And it's just generally a mess. So making it work versus making it right is taking a few hours to just clean the room, take the dishes out of the corner, maybe do something to the roaches. I don't want to offend anybody. So <laughs> I'm not going to say, well, no, I'll say it because I don't like roaches. You try and kill the roaches, get rid of the roaches, uh, take the take the bowl into the kitchen, you know, sweep up, figure out what the smell is, maybe open a window, get the air out, and generally just tidy up and organize. So what that means is, in, in the context of code, so this doesn't get too abstract, what that means is taking the time to organize your code. Maybe, you know, break your, your, your code into separate files, organize it into modules. Uh, take those modules and break them down into smaller functions that are a little easier to maintain. Maybe organize them into a flow that's easy to follow and understand. And generally just tidying up. So basically, just like you would when you walk into a room that's really clean, you're like, oh, wow, it's really tidy in here. You should be able to get that same exact experience with your code. You should be able to look at it. And you shouldn't, you know, like your instinct shouldn't be to apologize. And I come across that, especially with mentoring all the time. So he's like, yeah, I'm sorry. I know it's a mess. It's, it's, it's literally like going to somebody's house when they haven't had a chance to clean recently. It's like, oh, I'm sorry. It's such a mess. I, I, uh. And it's just kind of like this like defeat of like, ah, oh, yeah, I, I can do better here. And, and I think that's important to kind of highlight too is we know we can do better. And so the point of all this discussion is that we should. We should, we should go from, yes, what you've written works but let's clean it up, let's tidy it up, and let's organize it. And so that's the point, that's the first point when it comes to this discussion of refactoring is you're saying, okay, I got it working, let me clean it up. And, and there's a fun side effect that kind of happens when you clean up your code like this, which is you tend to find bugs that hadn't occurred yet. 
And those bugs are, are little things. They're usually, and, and generally, and I know like the, the, this is, this is about to ignite the TypeScript folks. <laughs> They're like shaking a stick. Uh, but like, if you have like, you passed a variable with the wrong name or of the wrong type to the wrong place and, and it's not, you know, uh, you weren't able to see that because the, the path for the code wasn't organized enough where you could see where it was going to break like that. Or, uh, maybe you, uh, you, you, you had an unused variable somewhere that you actually didn't need in your code and it's just adding more confusion. It doesn't really matter what it is, but it's just like really dumb little bugs that, you know, tend to bring the, the house of cards down, so to speak. So it's like uh, you run the code and three quarters of the time is perfectly fine. But then in this one case, uh, you have like you have to get user data out of the database and that one user is missing some property that the function is expecting and you didn't actually code for and you didn't organize your code to, to you know, get around that property if it's not there. And then it just goes, and the whole thing falls apart. Um, those, those type of bugs can be fixed when you, when you focus on going from getting it to work versus getting it right. Um, and those are, the, again, those are small bugs. They're not necessarily big ones, but you will catch them. And you'll also just catch other stuff too. Sometimes it's bigger stuff um, that you hadn't really anticipated, but it, it, and it's weird. It's the, the reason I'm kind of stumbling over this is it's hard to articulate, but once you get into the process of, of cleaning up your code, you're going to just find a bunch of stuff that would have caught you off guard later, would have caught a user off guard and then kind of by extension would have caught you off guard. Uh, but that's just one part of it. So again, it's make it work, make it right, make it fast. So make it work, make it right. You can have the most beautiful code in the world, but that same exact code might be kind of slow and kludgy. Um, and again, this is this is going to be specific to your code base and whatever, you know, we'll, we'll kind of scope it to a feature, whatever feature you're working on. Um, it's not something that's, I, it's not going to just be like a, a universal thing necessarily. Uh, but a good example might be... Um, Somewhere in a code, like uh, somewhere in the code you've written, we'll say uh, you're uploading a file uh, from the from the browser to the service. We're uploading an image, and we'll say we're uploading it to Amazon S3. So in that flow, there's kind of three choke points where things might get slowed down. So you've got um, in the browser, so literally like clicking the the file input, selecting a file, and reading that file into memory. Uh, the next point would be transferring that that file in memory from the browser up to the server. And then the final would be if you're trying to store it on something like Amazon S3, the, the transfer between the, the server and Amazon S3. So all three of those points and kind of everything related with those points, somewhere in there you could have code that's slowed down. So where refactoring really comes in is being able to spot what those points are. And, and I have to, to say that it's not something where you're just going to get it immediately. So typically this level of refactoring comes in later. So once you've at, at the very least put something into staging and, and if you're, you're fortunate enough to have a bunch of testers, like you're, you're working as part of a company or a team and you can have people that'll test your code. Um, typically this is, this is after they've had a chance to play with it. Or maybe if you have users that are, that are beta testers, you can, you can let them loose on it and see, but typically it's after the code's been used. So again, this is, we've, we've, We've made it work. We've made it right. Now that it's right, and we think it should mostly be working, we we let it loose on on users and kind of see where it gets kludgy. And now we're going back for another kind of third coat of paint, where we're saying, okay, now let's make this fast. So you look for those choke points, and you're saying like, okay, let's go in and clean those up. And cleaning those up is, it can deal with code. So uh, you know, maybe a good example is. Uh, your code is really tidy, but you're using um, a for loop with await statements in it. So async await statements. So I'm talking specifically about JavaScript here. Uh, so you've got uh, async await statements inside of a for loop. Guilty, I've done that. Um, and what you find is that the bigger that, that array that the, the for loop is looping over and the more or the longer the, the await takes to complete, oh, wow, this is really slowing things down. So it could be refactoring things like that. It could be going in and refactoring just database queries. So maybe everything else is clean, but the way that you've written your query is inefficient, or maybe you forgot to do indexes. So when it comes to refactoring, it's not just focused on the immediate code that you're writing, but it might be something kind of tangentially related. So you've got 
you know, so my, my go-to database is MongoDB, and sometimes I forget to write indexes for my MongoDB queries, and next thing you know, like, localhost is fine, and then I put it in production, and, and it just slows to a crawl. Um, and so those are things that you can look for. But the point here is that you're, you're going even further beyond making the code tidy for you as a developer. And you're, it's in a way you're making it tidy for the end user, because even if your code is the, it's a monument to, to engineering, like it's the most beautiful thing in the world. You have to remember that your users don't see that they don't know about that. And so it's worth factoring that into what you're doing is like remember that your code is in is in uh, a means to an end it's it's allowing your users to extract some form of value from your product so as disheartening as that can be for some of us because i know and, and and it's i've i've kind of credited or thought about myself in this way like it's it's a form of art like writing really clean code is something to be proud of but unfortunately the end users aren't really going to care they're not really going to to know about that unless in some kind of backwards way, your or not backwards, some kind of way your your product is actually for developers. So okay, I have an example. So something like Stripe. So their API, their documentation, all that stuff is their product, um, and it's it's something that developers would see. But it, it unless you're in the situation where that happens to be your customer base and the the use of your product, generally speaking, nobody's going to know or care how pretty your code is. What they care about is how fast it is, and, and more specifically, they don't even care that the code's fast. They care about not wasting time getting the value that your product has promised. That's it. So they don't care that, you know, oh, well, wow, you made that resolve in 0.3 seconds. They don't want to think about that. And and you got to put yourself in, in the user's shoes. So if you think about yourself using a web app of any sort, it doesn't matter what it is, or using any sort of product, you want it fast. You don't want it slow. And you're not going to be like, oh, no, developer. Oh, no, person. That's okay that it's slow. like, no, you're going to get frustrated. And you're going to get angry. Your users are exactly the same. And so you got to put yourself in, in their shoes and say, okay, how can I make this something that I would enjoy consuming? So if I was the user, I would enjoy this. And so keeping those sort of thoughts in mind, make things like refactoring code that much easier to do because you're like, oh yeah, I'm making somebody's life better here. It doesn't matter how small it's, it, you're, you're basically removing something from their day that would otherwise be frustrating as hell. And that's something to look forward to. And it's, it, it kind of plays into, uh, how you sell this. So one of the, the, the obvious pushbacks on this is like, well, we don't have time to refactor. I don't have time to refactor. I have a boss. I have a manager. I have, you know, I have to, I have to meet some quota or I have to, we're doing sprints and I got to get this done before this time. And that sort of stuff is true. I'm not saying that it's, it's, those aren't real things, but it's important to put the onus on yourself as the developer to kind of sell why you would want to refactor, why you would want you and your team to have the time to refactor. Um, and, and the reason why, if you have to sell this to somebody it always comes back or it always should come back to business value. So when it comes to uh, like, what would a conversation look like? So if I was trying, so me as a developer trying to sell this to a manager, we'll say um, it could be a number of things. It could be something as simple as uh, we're going to have fewer support requests from users because we've considered all the edge cases and now we're just not going to get support tickets on those things. It could be, oh, well, it's it's faster to get through the checkout. And so uh, we're going to make more money faster because people aren't going to get frustrated and abandon their cart. Um, it could be, oh, we've sped up the onboarding process for getting customers into the product. So when they use it, they get it quicker. They don't have to wait as long. It, it, it really doesn't matter what it is. It's just the important part is that if you're in the position where you feel like you have to sell the why of why you should be refactoring or why you need time to do it, always try and map it back to some sort of business value you want it because that's ultimately the language of a manager or somebody who's non-technical is they're going to understand like oh it's going to save us money it's going to save us time it's going to and and those are pretty much the two key things to focus on so those are the ones most people are going to care about if we're honest so they care about saving money and they care about saving time at the business level um, and kind of a, a third one which should be 
kind of top of the list and really special organizations get this um, is improving the experience for customers. So because those sort of sort of organizations understand that if you improve the product for customers, the other stuff is going to just kind of come back to you naturally. So you're just going to have more time because, well, customers aren't upset about the product not working. Uh, and you're going to have more money because they're going to be like, yeah, this is awesome. Take my money. And they'll tell their friends about it. Take my money. It's, it's, it's very simple. So those are the sorts of things to focus on if you feel like you're, oh, well, I want to do it, but I don't have the time and my boss won't give me time. Don't, don't kind of cop out and say like, well, I don't have time, so I guess that's not happening. Make the time. And, and really fight to have the time to do this because... Again, and I, this this is coming purely from experience. Yes, I've I've heard other people say it anecdotally, but I've I've experienced it personally, and the difference is night and day. It's going from well, I've got all this stuff working, and it might hold up for a few weeks, maybe if I'm lucky, a few months, to just busting into shambles, and it interrupts my day, and I got to go back and fix all this stuff, and then you get stressed out because you're having to go back and fix things that you thought were working, and it just creates all this unnecessary stress. Whereas if you say up front. Now, you know what? I'm going to take a little more time on this. I'm going to put a little more effort into what I'm doing and I'm going to get it right now. And the end result, always, this is, this is at least since I've been doing this, the, the end result is always that you don't really have to go back unless you want to. Meaning, unless you want to add some functionality to a feature or maybe you want to be even more obsessive and... <laughs> Uh, try and eke a little more performance out. But past a certain point, like you just don't have to go back. And I'm guessing if you're like a lot of developers, that resonates with you. That's something that you're like, yeah, it would be nice to not go into work and have somebody freaking out and me having to fix a bunch of bugs or like working on your own product. Oh, okay, good. I don't I don't have to <laughs> you know, go wake up on Monday and deal with a bunch of angry customers in my inbox. It's just, it's it works. Yes, it took you more time up front or it took away from the short-term enjoyment, but long-term, you're just good. You can go hang out or go focus on something else. You don't have to worry about constantly plugging holes uh, in your sinking ship. It's like the ship, is it was built correctly the first time, so there are no holes. Ta-da! You know, it sounds, it's, it's one of those things that it's, it's simple but not easy. Um, but I, I think it's worth putting that that onus on yourself to really go and and take the time to refactor and think about refactoring and and just make it a part of your process because it's only ever going to help you it's one of those things that will never hurt you it's only going to help you so you know as you're building your own product and if you're working on a team i i know i tilted this conversation a little more toward those folks cuz that's that's where i've heard a lot of the stories from but this this definitely plays into uh, your own stuff. Make the time to refactor and just do it right the first time because doing it right the first time is going to save you from limitless freaking headaches later. So uh, that's it. Rant over. Um, go out, go refactor some code. Doesn't matter how much time you spend, but just, just spend some time refactoring and try and bake it in your process and try and make it something that you you really give some energy to because I think it's gonna it's going to help you long term more than it's going to hurt you actually i can guarantee it so uh that's going to do it for this week folks uh again thanks for listening in i know this format's changing up a little bit don't let that spook you uh you know let me know if you you like this or like the video I've, i know i've been kind of like looking down and looking up uh, if you enjoy the video let me know please uh leave a comment on youtube or you know again send me a tweet um i'm personally at our glover on twitter but you can also find me at C L V R B G L on Twitter. Somebody, somebody grabbed clever beagle. So I, I guess I'm stuck with C L V R B G L. Uh, but definitely give me some feedback and let me know if this is something that you like, or you think it's stupid or whatever. It doesn't matter. Just let me know. Um, and also if you, if you haven't already subscribed on YouTube or you're, you're listening to the audio and you're thinking like, Oh wow, I'd like to watch this on YouTube later. Um, head over to, uh, youtube.com slash clever beagle hit the subscribe button and definitely check that out. Um, I would really appreciate it if you subscribe there. Uh, there's tons of other videos. I do uh, another uh, show on Fridays just specifically on YouTube called Feature Friday. So if you haven't checked that out, uh, what I do is I walk you through building a feature or whatever I'm currently working on. I kind of break it down for you and I explain, you know, this is, this is what 
uh, it takes to build a feature and, and, and how it all works. So if you're looking for a more technical hands-on kind of type of content, check that out. I, I, I think you'd really like it. Um, so that's going to do it for this week, folks. Thanks again for listening. Uh, and I will see you next Monday.